Look, I don't know what more I can tell you. My name is Carl Kolchak. I'm a freelance reporter in town to cover the Pentagon report for the Roswell, New Mexico incident. I know nothing about this guy Prescott who's missing. And I had nothing to do with any explosion. All I know is what I saw and that I've spent all day running into, running from, and being threatened by you and the other thugs in the black suits and sunglasses. Well, Carl, you've really done it this time. I'm sitting in some college lounge, being interrogated by federal agents for involvement with possible kidnapping, working with a suspected foreign spy, and sabotage. One agent, the redhead, had the most amazing eyes that in any other circumstance would be a joy to see. She was using them on me, trying to play good cop. She said, You have to admit, Mr. Kolchak, that there are parts of your story that stretch the limits of credibility. At the very least, it doesn't explain your trespassing on university property, even if you were helping who you described. The tall one, who looked like he walked out of a men's warehouse ad, was doing a lousy job of bad cop. Mr. Kolchak, I can understand you're frustrated, confused, and even scared by the events you experienced, and that you may not be remembering everything accurately. If you could please just go over it again from the beginning, it may recall something you missed or give us details that we can check on. I took off my hat, put on my most indignant look that I could muster, and looked him in the eye, and then prepared to tell him the tale I had to sell them on, for both my sake and that strange thing I helped to get away. Agent Mulder? I spent my life getting the story, finding the truth, at a part of one brief period today. I remember everything, so I'll tell it again. The day began not unlike any other in the busy city. You wake up, perform the morning rituals of meal, dress, and drive on your way to work, just like the rest. But this time, you were caught by fate. The brakes in a truck fail. Instead of stopping, it flies through the intersection you were crossing and T-bones your sedan with tremendous force. Sends it spinning into the opposite corner, bouncing off more cars. After a moment, you rise and crawl out of the wreck, hurt but lucky to be alive. The people all stare at you, and you sense they have more fear than for your concern. It's easy to see why. Or it is what they see and don't believe. You are no longer human looking. The witnesses claim that what climbed out of the victim's car was male, dressed in a nice suit, and had the bleeding head of a lizard. It stood for a moment, looked around confused, and then, in a panic, ran down an alleyway and disappeared. Sadly, the camera phone was still a new concept. Bystanders were in shock and didn't have the reflexes of taking pictures or video of something they might later need to prove. Lucky for them, the nation's capital was an early advocate for the red light traffic cams. Many times in my travels, I have to take detours from my own pursuits for paying gigs, freelance assignments from other sites or magazines. A smart actor once remarked why they sometimes did lousy films. They said they usually pay better than the critical films, so it's one for the reels and one for the meals. 
Well, this reporter has to eat too. So I was in DC to cover the Pentagon report panel releasing yet another explanation for the incident at Roswell on its 50th anniversary for some European UFO magazines. I was driving to the Capitol building and unless there's a good game to listen to, I usually have my radio on the police scanner. This time, it paid off. There was a call for a traffic accident with injuries. Three vehicles at the intersection of K Street and Northwest 21st. But it was what followed that got my attention. All units, all units, please be advised of Code November situation at scene. Repeat, Code November is at scene. Code November. I'd heard of that before. It's a situation referring to special government agencies at the scene and pretty much shutting the area down. It came from the Kennedy assassination at Dealey Plaza, which happened in November of 1963. For that call, here in the nation's capital, it must be something newsworthy indeed, surely better than some rehashed weather balloon story. I can catch that late and ask around after I check this out. Little did I know, the chase was on. When I arrived at the scene, things still seemed a bit chaotic. The tow truck and ambulance was there but the cops were outside the area and not allowing either into it. It was my lucky day, so far, as I went up to an officer to go in. He must have been a rookie. He said, Stop. This area is off limits. And I said, Not to me it isn't. And I flashed him my press credentials. He gave me a blank stare, hardly looked at it, and just waved me in. Maybe it was my suit. Altogether, there were about 40 pedestrians milling about, being guided back and forth to different groups by some ominous men, all dressed in dark suits, some with earpieces talking into their wrists. I knew they weren't witnesses. Instead, they were grilling and dividing those who saw into those who cooperate and those who don't. I was able to speak to a few people while not drawing attention. They described a basic accident the truck slammed into the car hard. They were surprised the occupant was able to walk away from it. But that is where things get strange. Like I was telling that detective, he got out of the car, holding his head, and then it, it looked like he put on a Halloween mask. Yeah, some uh, Godzilla mask or something. So he looked around for a second, and then he just took off across the intersection and ran through the crowd. Strangest thing, he should have been real banged up. The detective said they think the guy might have robbed a bank or something, so he, he's trying to hide his looks. A couple of others seemed to say the same thing, almost word for word, which made me suspicious they'd been convinced that was what they saw. It didn't make sense. Wearing a mask? And that car is badly wrecked. Walking would have been hard enough. There's someone taking samples of some blue liquid on the ground next to the car. But it was at that time my presence had been noticed. I'd been surrounded by three feds who promptly moved me off to the side of the road. ID, now, one said. And you are? I said as my credentials were taken before I could offer it. We're with the government. Really? Which part? We asked the questions, and did the discussion, as one turned around with my ID and mumbled something into his sleeve. And he sped back around and nodded a no to thug number one, who looked at it, gave it back, and then said, Kolchak, leave, now. This was not the day to challenge an order. So I made it back to the car. Every step of the way, I could feel his gaze on me. Whatever happened here wasn't some simple accident involving a bugger.
So, what did you two find out about it? Or are you part of those stormtroopers? Mulder said, no, we're still trying to ascertain which agencies were involved at the scene. We were otherwise engaged, and by the time we arrived, they had cleared out. We're not always informed of active investigations beyond the FBI's jurisdiction. I said, oh, so even you get the short end of the stick sometimes. The expression he got told me it happens more than sometimes. The redhead chimed in. We are still gathering details on the accident. We can say the car is registered to a William Prescott, an executive for an important lobbying firm in D.C., and currently we're unable to find him. It's possible it wasn't him in the car, and the person may have something to do with his disappearance. It may be the same person you encountered based on your description, although it seems unlikely. I know what I saw. Mr. Kolchak, while we have reports of someone with a mask, no one has reported seeing a nearly six-foot-tall lizard person running around in the city. Only you. Suddenly, the good cop, bad cop, switch sides. Scully, it is possible that it could have some defense mechanism. Evolved, like a chameleon, to blend into its background, making it very difficult to notice or identify. The octopus can even become fluid-like, so its form can contort into practically any shape, along with color and texture. Balder. If so, it wasn't doing a very good job of it. It was hurt, Scully. Maybe it takes concentration, or requires some device to operate. While I wondered how long these two had been married, it was time to get going with this. We're wasting too much time as it is. So I interrupted. Would you two like to go and have a debate about it, or should I continue? They gave each other a look, then asked me to continue. So, I drove around for about an hour, looking for anything that might have given me a clue. And then I heard a standard call from an alarm triggered at some business, a possible break-in. It wasn't close, but there was nothing else happening here, so I headed there. Good thing I knew my way. I used to work this town in my earlier days, when I was moving up. I easily beat the cops, since they only care about the paperwork if no one's getting killed. I drove down an alley and parked, walked back up to the front, and saw a side door that looked forced in. The lock looked strong, but broke. And since it was already open, I made my way in, in case someone needed help. It looked like some storage room for whatever business that it was, apparently closed. Some stuff was in disarray, but it could just be messy. I walked around, room to room, not finding anything that looked out of place, but I was hearing movement, like I was playing a game of hide and seek with someone. After about five minutes, I wasn't getting any closer, so I started making my way back. Either they found another way to get out, or they'd be leaving the same way. What I found, found me. At the door I entered in, once again were the men in black. This time, they didn't seem so cheerful. One took each arm, against my protesting, and pulled me out of the building, into the alley, to see a dark sedan exiting were two more men wearing black, although one had a much finer fashion sense with it. That was the one who addressed me. Mr. Kolchak, you have a habit of showing up where you don't belong. That's very unhealthy. Why are you here? I tried to sound unfazed, cracked a smile and said, I was thinking of buying a new hat. He smiled like a tiger before he has his meal. These gentlemen will walk you back to your car, and if you remember or ever see my face again, you'll have nothing left to hang your hat on. Goodbye, Mr. Kolchak. The two heavies walk me down the alley, while I'm thinking they just may kill me anyway if I give them any trouble, which got complicated, as I noticed something different. I had to try and play this off without alerting them, so I said, 
Thank you, gentlemen. I, I believe I know the rest of the way. I was ten feet away from my car. They stood there and let me continue on my own. But I may be jumping from the frying pan into the fire. See, it's a real warm day here in D.C. And unless it's raining, or I have stuff in the car, my top is always down. But it isn't right now. My gut is telling me someone is hiding in my car. I stood there at the car door, still being watched by those goons, but fearing for what waits in my car. Then I felt a wave of calm wash over me, and I just opened the door and got inside, like I was on some automatic pilot. I sat there. I could sense someone in the back on the floor, but I couldn't turn around. I heard this voice, but not with my ears. It said, Start the car and drive away, Mr. Kolchak. Please. But it felt more like an order. I couldn't refuse. And I did just what it said. I slowly drove by the suits and back into the streets. So, where am I going? Is there some place special you want to kill me at? I could hear some movement behind me, hoping it wasn't right here and now. The voice spoke again in my head. It I need you to relax, Mr. Kolchak. I don't want to kill you or anyone. I just want you to help me avoid those men and get to someplace safe and relax. You are in more danger from those men than from me. Just follow my directions. The voice guided me for 20 minutes to pull into a lower level parking garage on K Street, knowing the code to input and where to park. Once parked, I asked, whom exactly am I helping? The voice told me to relax and prepare myself. I felt myself getting lightheaded, almost drunk, but I could move on my own again. I turned around slowly and looked. In the back seat, with huge eyes looking back at me, was some sort of a man-sized reptile wearing a trench coat. Normally, this would be the part where I would scream, roll out of the door, and run. Somehow, all these instinctive actions were just washing over me. This thing had some firm grip Maybe it could make me do anything. So, what are you? And why are those men after you? Time to see if I can get some answers on all this. Who and what I am, you wouldn't understand. Those men are part of, of an agency who try to capture any not of your race on this world. My mind was easing up. I seem to be coping with what this thing is, probably from years of encountering other things. Okay, so they know what you are, and that you're some alien? You need to get back to your ship, right? Maybe this thing crashed here and needs to phone home or something. No. No, no ship. I live here. I am injured and need help to go home for treatment my head to hurt to hide now it made no sense to me how could it live here i needed to explain more of what it's telling me i could see some dark blue stain on the side of its head it what do i call you and how do you live in dc and why how am I hearing you without speaking? You, you can call me Bill. My name and Tom. You wouldn't understand. I work here in secret. My mind is more developed 
can do things. Now please, sleep. Then I turned around in my seat and went to sleep. That's it? You just nodded off in front of a lizard person. The one named Scully was using those wide eyes on me again. What could I say? It was like I was told what to do and I just did it. All I could say was I could tell it was hurt and seemed to be struggling just to communicate with me. So I fell asleep and the next thing I knew, it was eight hours later. I was driving and pulling onto the campus here. Are you saying you experienced missing time? You have no recollection of any events or actions between then and now? Mulder seemed to hone in at that time, like it was something he knew from experience. Well, no, yes, I mean, I don't know. I know I fell asleep. I just can't remember anything up until I was driving here. Just talking to Bill, the lizard man. At that point, Mulder's cell phone buzzed. He answered and then stepped away for a moment while Scully began questioning me more on what else I remembered about the lizard man to see if she could trip me up on my story. Good luck with that. Mulder speaks into his phone. Okay, guys, what have you got? Oh, it's not good, Mulder. Yeah, this guy Prescott is getting the eraser treatment. Data's literally disappearing from our screen as we watch. Mulder, six years ago, this person Prescott appeared out of nowhere. No background, schools, or medical records. All were great fakes. Couldn't fool me. But that's all being replaced right now with some puff piece tailored to look like a Cold War spy novel character. It looks like a cover story's being prepared for him. This is definitely a black ops job now. We'll keep working on it. Mulder replied, okay. Did you find anything on Mr. Kolchak? Did we ever? We need to get him an application. He checks out as a reporter, but some of the stories, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but they're out there. Really, Fox? You two could be bunkmates. When Mulder stepped back into the room, he wasn't happy, but seemed to look at me differently. I don't know how to take that, but I continued. So, like I was telling you, the next thing I remember is I'm driving, talking to Bill on where we were going. He said he's strong enough to make it to an access point of a tunnel here. So we arrived at Georgetown. Bill said his kind have various places where they can come up to our world and one of them is here. We parked out of sight and were quickly moving, bush to bush, shadow to shadow, trying not to be seen. Bill was struggling, but keeping up with me. He said there was a tunnel hidden here in case of emergencies like this. They lead down deep into the earth where his uh, species live. They'd been living down there for millions of years before mankind evolved. They came up here and do so from time to time just to keep tabs on us. But the government is aware of them and try to capture them to find ways to locate and attack them. As if on cue, we spotted several black SUVs pulling in, loaded with MIBs. They must have figured out Bill was with me and tailed us. Bill said he expected this because he heard in their thoughts one of the agents had suspected me being involved with him. We were still in a bush and needed to run to the entrance of a building. We'd be seen for sure. He told me once we get to the building to split up, for me to draw them away from him. He needs a distraction to get to his access point without them finding it or him. When we got to the door, he pushed me inside, then he dropped the trench coat and blended into the bush next to the door. In my head, I heard him say, now run, thanks. I'm sorry, and goodbye. I began a mad dash, 
running through the halls, taking stairs, pulling fire alarms, anything to draw attention and to keep me from getting shot. It was a losing battle. Within a few minutes, I burst into a sparsely filled forum class, but some agents, including Mr. Bad Guy, had both doors already covered, also charging in with the campus police, considering everyone a suspect. Then there was this really loud explosion coming from somewhere close that shook everything. The campus cops drew their guns on all of us. I took that as an opportunity and I surrendered to them while the agents were still speaking into their raised sleeve about the complication. Another agent went to the campus cop and said something which took them out of the arrest. They showed some IDs that looked a lot like yours. They were about to put their mitts on me when the one in charge shook his head. As they cleared out, Mr. Bad Guy looked at me in the face and said, Mr. Kolchak, perhaps another time? And then he left. The cops held me here, and then you came, and I've been talking with you ever since. That is my story. Then the redhead's phone rang, and she stepped away. So Mulder started to share a theory with me. Mr. Kolchak, are you aware that there's a scientist who says a period hundreds of millions of years ago showed a level of industrial gases in our atmosphere similar to an advanced society? Possibly some of all dinosaurs lived like us, but time wiped away all the physical traces. The Silurian hypothesis says they might have left the planet or burrowed deep into it and live there now to avoid the changes in climate and living conditions. If only he knew. As much as I'd like to give him some insight into what I know, I just said, Well, Agent Mulder, all I can say is, if you ever do run into anything like that, don't take any of its eggs. Scully came back in, and from the look on her face, that call is going to change everything involving me. Meanwhile, another call was being placed, one that none of us were privy to. Sir, a call's been made. They were told it was just a boiler malfunction, no foul play. A suspect has no involvement and could be released. A sweeper team has removed all evidence of the sabotage. We're sure it was the Silurian to draw us away. We're using the trace detector, and we should find the entrance around daylight. On the other end, in a dimly lit room, a man with no name or identity. As far as the government knows, he doesn't exist and moves silently in between the cracks. See that you do. Keep it small. A three-man team to avoid attention. I'll make sure Agent Mulder has nothing left to work with. Let me know what it's found and tell no one. After telling us that there was nothing suspicious about the explosion, and they had nothing other than trespassing on which to hold me, and that they could do nothing on that without finding the agency that chased me, I was free to go. But they may want to contact me further. Then Agent Scully left to call local authorities to see if she could run down any samples from that wreck at the labs. As Agent Mulder walked me back to my car, he started talking about his background and how he had prior experiences that were not easily explained. Mr. Kolchak, I joined the FBI because of losing someone to a phenomena in the hopes I would be able to expand my search. But even with federal authority, I still get blocked, both by powers within the government wanting to hide and by those not willing to accept where the road leads. Do you know how hard it is to do your job when your own boss doesn't even believe you? I gave him a smile and said, Agent Mulder, you have no idea. I told him that I'd be around another day just to try and salvage the story I was supposed to be writing 
and he offered to buy me lunch. Compare notes on the Roswell case-closed farce we both missed. We exchanged contact info, and he gave me a card on a place to check out. Then I left to get some sleep. Mulder met Scully and then went to the car to drive back to the office for paperwork. As usual, they had some very different opinions about both the events and of yours truly. I'm telling you, Scully, I believe what he told us, that there are intelligent reptilians here among us taking places in our society. It could explain some of the related sightings and UFO reports that differ from the greys that we've gotten. Mulder, be reasonable. That man makes a living writing sensational stories. The only alien he got mixed up with was probably on the run from immigration. He's likely to write us into his next story as scary federal terminators. Did you find anything on the samples? Yes. The vehicle was originally towed by Capitol Police, but then it was seized by the Secret Service. They're claiming it's part of an active investigation of a Libyan spy working with a lobbying group. That would be Mr. Prescott. They did find some blue viscous fluid at the scene and took some for testing in case it was drugs. They expect to have the results by mid-morning. Maybe that'll give us an idea of what really happened. I don't know, Scully. I know there's more to this than just a car accident and a spy on the run. We both know a lot of agents responded to these incidents, and if there was a foreign spy, then the FBI would have been informed and involved. In the morning, I want to open up an investigation into the lobby firm, see what they were working on. Who knows? Maybe Prescott wasn't the only lizard person there. And what if it turns out they represent some think tank fighting to get disclosure? about the truth on extraterrestrials. Would that burst your bubble? I doubt that. Although it might be comforting to know there was one secret organization working toward what I'm looking into. Maybe exposing one truth could lead to others. That ancient a society would rather be very intent on defending their secrets. The next morning, Agents Mulder and Scully's presence is requested at the office of Director Skinner. They are informed the request for their investigation has been denied. He says it would interfere with an already existing probe on possible influence peddling and state secrets. It's now a national security issue and beyond the X-Files purview. Scully is informed that the samples got destroyed in a lab accident. Mulder takes an assessment of the room, detects something, then asks Skinner, where did the details of this existing investigation and refusal come down from? To which the director looked over at his no smoking sign and said, I think you know where. A gentleman wearing a garish and well-worn Twilby hat and a seersucker suit so outdated it was coming back in style parks next to a nondescript building in a small industrial and storage district. He rings the bell after checking the card again and stands in front of a steel door while assaulted by a camera and speaker asking who it was. He gives his name, business, and a smile, after which he hears a buzzer and the door lets him in. Walking down a short, dim hall, he steps into a room of clutter, gadgets, and papers. Standing inside, he sees three odd-looking men next to a wall banner that says, The Lone Gunman. To them he says, Hello, gentlemen. I hear you may have a job for me. Later that day, in some New York high-rise, a dark room full of even darker men are met with the darkest of all. Cigarette smoke wafting from his mouth. The conversation that follows all involve him Many questions, few answers. We heard there was an incident yesterday in D.C. There were units deployed, and some of our assets put up a cover story. Why weren't we informed earlier about it? That's where I've been. I handled it. 
like always. There was no exposure. He's always careful to show no weakness, no emotion in front of them. It would be like spilling blood in shark-infested waters, and they would finish him. To show the event meant nothing, he casually draws another Morley from his pack and ignores the other questions. But the Syndicate is not easily satisfied. We operate as a group. You may think you're a lone wolf, but there is no secrets with us. What did you encounter? He lights up, takes a puff, and gives him the story he's practiced. He was a Silurian, somehow injured and unable to hide. It was spotted on one of our traffic cam algorithms. We had to move fast to contain the witnesses, but it escaped the perimeter. My men are tracing its home location. They'll be checking in shortly. A heavyset man chimed in. What about Mulder? My department shows he was involved. How? What did he learn? You were supposed to keep the X-Files contained. If he keeps popping up, learn something. Mulder learns nothing, except what I give him, to keep him off the real trail. Don't forget, it was I who took care of a leak from this very group. And I can take care of Mulder at any time he's no longer of use to us. For now, the plan stays the same. From the other end of the table, another voice is heard, coming from a very fashionably dressed gentleman, with a most dangerous smile. He said, And what about this other person, Mr. Kolchak? This is not the first time he's meddled in our affairs. He stumbled upon the Ring Project, our earlier super soldier efforts. He has had other episodes as well. Now that he and Mulder have crossed paths, what do you think this will lead to? The cigarette-smoking man slowly walked over to the window, casting more light onto him than he is normally comfortable with. As Morley droops down, as he stares out the window and says, Gentlemen, we may have a new problem. Look, you're in my head, you're making me do things, you even put me to sleep. If you need my help, you're going to have to convince me that this is the right thing to do, or so help me, I'll fight you and swerve right into a car myself. I needed to get something from this bill. Maybe, if I press him, it'll work. I understand, Mr. Kolchak. Please, I am grateful for your help, and I am in your debt for helping me and my kind this way. I will share with you that my kind are among humanity and use our influence to try and save you. Man is too easily close to destroying yourselves and our world with you. So we fight from inside to keep you from doing so, along with working against others from outside your world. There is a greater war among the stars for this world which forces in your government secretly conspire to negotiate their own seat of power. They are also our enemy, the men that were after me. Someday soon, we hope to expose both the alien threat and the plot of the shadow government. We wish to them come forth and try to unite our races and build 
a better Earth for all. Until then, we must stay a secret. It was a lot to take in. So you're saying you are the good guys, saving us from ourselves. Maybe you should have started with that. Maybe, Mr. Kolchak. I wanted you to know this now. But I'm afraid I cannot let you keep this secret knowingly. So it will be lost to you when I next tell you goodbye. I'm sorry. What? We are here now. Make this turn. 